At the Daniels College, our experience here is both different and better, and we'd like to tell you why. At most business schools, the center of learning is going to be the classroom. At Daniels, you're going to learn, and you're going to learn more by doing. We're going to get you out of the classroom and into the marketplace. We're going to engage you with real businesses and real business leaders across Colorado and around the world. The Daniels difference is about putting you feet first into the real world long before you graduate. By tackling real world problems, you learn to think creatively and work with diverse skill sets. This is what employers really want, and they tell us that every day. Small classes mean that you will not get lost in the shuffle. Personal development is the key to every Daniels program. We have committed our institution to a different path, a fresh approach that requires as much work on yourself as it does on your coursework and it's an approach that works. Daniels graduates are in demand. If you're interested in an education that provides you with real world experience that enables you to develop your own deep personal leadership narrative that will ensure that you enter the world market ready, then you're looking at the Daniels difference and we'd love to talk with you about it. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Yan Cho, Chief Operating Officer at the Daniels College of Business. Good evening. Welcome to the third and final Voices of Experience of the 2018-19 academic year. It is fitting that this culminating event of the season is also the culmination of our moderator's time at the Daniels College of Business. Dean Brent Kreit came to DU in 2014, and he is leaving the university in June to become the seventh president of Bethune-Cookman University in Daytona Beach, Florida. Dean Kreit has accomplished so much in his time here at Daniels. He has overhauled the curricular content and structure of the college's entire programmatic portfolio, putting the emphasis on a challenge-driven approach. Under his leadership, Daniels created a new undergraduate minor in entrepreneurship and added two graduate programs, an executive PhD and an online MBA. With support from our external partners, he created a Center for Sales Leadership, an Institute for Family Business, and the Consumer Insights and Business Innovation Center, or CIBIC. In addition, he recruited 32 exemplary new faculty members, 19 of whom are tenured or tenure track. This is but a small sample of all that Brent has accomplished. The faculty, staff, students, and alumni have seen the benefits of your efforts, and we are so grateful for all you have done for the college. <laughs> now a bit about tonight. Dean Kreit and our speaker, Abdul Fattah Sharaf, have actually met before when Brent traveled to Abdul Fattah's office in Dubai. Dean Kreit is an expert on building individual and institutional economic capacities in challenging emerging markets around the world. He has worked on behalf of the World Bank to build education and business assistance programs in Ethiopia and Tanzania, and on behalf of the Eurasia Foundation to strengthen the private sector in Uzbekistan. He recently completed a three-year engagement to improve business education and entrepreneurship in Afghanistan working under the auspices of the U.S. State Department and engaging D Daniel's faculty. For these reasons, he's an excellent person to engage with our speaker tonight. Please welcome Dean Brent Kreit. Thanks very much. That was very kind. Uh, too kind and too long. I appreciate it. Uh, thank you all for being here. I, I am just delighted to welcome each of you. As you glean from the video and as Ian talked about, at the Daniels College, we've recognized for years that the very best of our experiences, the very best of the experiences that we can provide for our students um, are those experiences that are, that are co-created. They're co-created with faculty and with staff, but equally important, they're co-created by our corporate partners to ensure that we can provide transformational opportunities for our students. 
And so I want to take a minute before I introduce our esteemed guests to acknowledge our sponsors and to thank them. Um, we're able to do this multiple times a year in this extraordinary facility at no cost because of the generosity and support of our sponsors. And so I want to, I want to just take a minute and acknowledge them. When we think about corporate partners, organizations like US Bank are the first that come to mind. Assam Salim, who is recently Colorado president and now regional president of US Bank, has been a steadfast and consistent and sustained contributor and partner to me and to the Daniels College. Please join me in giving a shout out to Hassan. I'd like now to welcome Connor Houlihan, who is a senior strategic finance manager at Newmont Mining. As you may know, Newmont has gone through a major transformation, so they let him up for air. Um, and congratulations on that. Um, Newmont has sponsored global projects for our students, has been a contributor to this event, to IE case competitions. Um, they have not ever said no to a request that we've made, and I want you and your colleagues to know how much we appreciate you. Please join me in thanking Newmont Mining and Collar Hulan. <laughs> Zayo Group has also come under um, extraordinary pressure of late and consummated, as you know, uh, a new uh, transaction just last week. Um, please join our MBA student, Brent Texel, who's representing Zayo Group as a third sponsor this evening. Brent. Okay, it is now my dis distinct pleasure to welcome um, our guest of honor, the Group General Manager, exec Chief Executive Officer, United Arab Emirates, and Head of International Banking for HSBC Middle East Limited. Abdul Fattah Sharaf is a Group General Manager and the Chief Executive Officer of United Arab Emirates. He is also the Head of International which covers Bahrain, Kuwait, and Algeria. Abdul Fattah is a member of the HSCB, HSBC Bank Middle East Limited, HBME, and HSBC Bank Oman, SAOG. Prior to his appointment as CEO for UAE, United Arab Emirates, he was a CEO personal financial services for North Africa and the Middle East and responsible for all HSBC's retail banking in the Middle East and North Africa, or the MENA region. He is also a board member of HSBC Saudi Arabia Limited, IBSA, and Emirates Telecommunication Company, Etelisat. Before joining HSBC Bank Middle East Limited, Abdul Fattah was the Chief Executive Officer of NBD Securities, which is a subsidiary of Emirates NBD. Abdul Fattah is currently a member of the higher board of the Dubai International Financial Center, DIFC, and a board member of the NOR Dubai Foundation. He is also a member of the MasterCard MEA Advisory Board and a member of the Advisory Board Council of the American University of Sharjah School of Business. He's also a board member of the Emirates Golf Federation. That's really quite important, actually. <laughs> um, for us, most importantly, 
at this time anyway, Abdul Fada is also a graduate of the University of Denver. We now have a short video of Mr. Sharaf. Meeting different people from different culture all over the world at University of Denver and learning about them set me up for success. What makes me an effective leader? Being myself, being open, meeting people, listening to them. The best advice I received, it was from a boss at National Bank of Dubai, who said to me, you decide whether you want to be a leader or a follower. The decision is yours. What I love about my job at HSBC, we were the first bank in the country over 70 years. We printed the first banknote. We helped the country building the skyline, which you see today, and we will be here for the exciting future. When I need to be inspired, I look around me in Dubai, everything is inspiring. Looking at the buildings, at people, diversity, 200 nationality, it is really inspiring. My advice to the graduate of 2019, follow your passion and do what you love. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming to the stage Mr. Abdul Fattah Sharaf. Welcome. Thank you very much. Welcome, welcome back to, to DU. Welcome back to, to Denver. I think half of the board, he said, I'm not on anymore. So I'm retired. <laughs> just, There's lots of boards to, to be to on. Just go with what I have. <laughs> Thank so you very much. So we, uh, we started, we started, uh, we had an early day. Um, we, we started, uh, I'll fall off with a, uh, with a golf game, of course. Uh, uh, it was cold and windy and as uh, about as far from the Middle East weather-wise as one could imagine. Thank you for, for, uh, for joining us out there. It was, it's been a blast and I've, I've enjoyed spending, Thank you very much. Uh, spending the day with you. I mean, they've been very kind and very hospitable. I mean, the uh, treatment I'm, I got in Denver, it's really tough. So thank you very much. Everybody who was involved in this, I really want to thank them. And they told me, don't bring any jacket in the morning, so I can freeze. <laughs> they yeah. said the weather will be better in half an hour. I know, right, right. And I looked at my watch, ten, <laughs> three hours, I said, it's still freezing. It was so cold. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was cold, yeah. Um, look, I, I'm, I'm excited about the chance to, uh, to, to talk with you. Um, I have a, a real interest in the Middle East. I've been blessed to, to spend some time there. Um, and I, I think if we, if we can, maybe on a, on a bit of a, a lighter note, you know, um, we, we'd like to get to know a little bit about you uh, and your, your upbringing and your, and your family. Um, give, us, give us some technicolor, give us a snapshot, if you will, of, of, of life. You don't want me to bore you with that. No, well, I, it'll be <laughs> far from boring, I'm sure. T tell, us, tell us about yourself. Yeah. Uh, I was born in 1968, uh, and I was born in the hospital, so <laughs> you saw that hospital. And usually, I mean, at uh, that time, people will be born at home, in the living room, so that's the hospital, you can see that. And I come from my father, my late mother, uh, my sibling, my two sisters, older than me, and my younger brother. My sister is the oldest sister. She's a grandmother, and she's a dentist. And the other one studied uh, hospital management, and she's retired, and time for me to retire. <laughs> and my younger brother, he runs the shopping malls in the Middle East, mm -hmm. so with MAF Group. Uh, you know, 
United Arab Emirates is a, a young country, and I w we lived in a family like very close to each other. So I would call my grandfather's house was uh, a hotel. Mm. So whoever wanted to go to Saudi, or whoever wanted to go to any other countries around us, they will stop by. And there was nothing called like you book an appointment. You just come and stay. So that's how it was and how it is still. I mean, okay, it's a little bit more advanced that people send you an email or call you or send mm -hmm. you WhatsApp. And United Arab Emirates was a uh, union at uh, 1971. It's uh, seven emirates. Capital is Abu Dhabi, then Dubai, uh, Sharjah, Ajman, Ras Al Khaimah, Um Al Quwain, and Fujairah. So emirates of uh, seven. And I studied at the government school, uh, and I. I mean, at that time we had to learn English was in grade six, and we were taught by Egyptian teachers at that time. And my father worked, you, you saw a picture of my father with Queen Elizabeth. So my father worked for British Embassy. So we come from a service family. And that was when she visited 1979 in Dubai. And my grandfather had a business, and when I say business, everybody thinks that he had so many offices, it's one shop. So that was all about. Uh, and he was one of the agents for a single uh, sewing machine. I don't know whether he was an agent or he was a distributor at that time. So he had that machine in his shop, but he had other things also. So. Uh, that's what he did. But my family also went into business. My uncles, they went into uh, trading and shipping, logistics. Then they grown. They are in electronics. Uh, so they have like around 10,000 people working for them. Wow. But my father was, uh, he retired from his job in year 2000 from British Embassy. But he's good, he's healthy, alhamdulillah, thank God. And he still goes to his small factory that he has, and I think keeping him busy. And more busy he is with our children, with his grandchildren. And he has a great granddaughter as well. So that's great. That's so tell us about the, the decision and then the, the journey um, from um, United Arab Emirates to the University of Denver in the middle of the country of all places. How did that happen? Uh, I wouldn't say we were from the first generation, but I think second generation, or first, maybe you could, second, I would say. Uh, the, the government was investing in, uh, in the people, in the human, in education. So they wanted us to go abroad and learn. At that time, you could go to UK or US. And I was lucky enough I mean, to visit UK because of my father's job. And of course, at that time, he had to do a lot of saving to take us a little bit around Europe for uh, in holidays. And I didn't see United States. So my dream was to come to state. Big cars, highways, <laughs> everything I saw it was in the movie. <laughs> so for me, it was dream. To come and my late mother, she was like, "You're gonna go to U.S. It's too far. How I'm gonna make a check on you? How I'm gonna ask about you?" I said, "I said this is the decision I made. I'll call you every day." <laughs> <laughs> so that's uh, and you know, I mean, like uh, it was uh, something I wanted to do, and I don't regret at all coming because when I arrived and. Colorado the first time, I, when I saw the highway, I said, wow, this is a road. <laughs> this is something you can say, this is a highway. And seeing the uh, technology and openness, and right. it, it was a great experience for me to be here. And you know, 
if you see one of the pictures, I used to go to Hatta as a place on Omani's border that we have mountains. But after what I saw here, it's like, <laughs> I yeah. stopped going there. <laughs> just, we, just, we just recalibrated. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. And today also, it was beautiful. Isn't that, we, yeah, it was amazing. We were at Arrowhead, for those of you that know, and it's just, just and, stunning. And, and you see the flag. I mean, when uh, I, I would like to highlight the, this flag was created by an Emirati. He was uh, 19 years old, and he's our ambassador today for on Czech Republic. So he created that flag uh, for the country. And I was reading his story. It said, like, he, could, he, he didn't know that he won till the day that they announced the uh, United Arab Emirates, mm -hmm. and they put the flag up, and he went running to see if it's his flag or right. not. <laughs> and he's our ambassador in Czech Republic today. So you um, decided to come to the U.S. You come from a family of entrepreneurs and business people. Um, how did you decide on a career in banking? Was it, was it intentional? Was it a direct route from college? Tell us, tell us how you ended up at HSBC. No, before, I mean, I studied political science. It was my major, and my minor was special education. And I wanted to be a diplomat. So first I worked in custom, Dubai custom, for nine months. Then I discovered it's a good place, but it's not for me. And at that time, National Bank of Dubai, they were hiring uh, graduates. And you know, we were very expensive commodity at that time. Graduate from US, you put your own numbers, you say, no, I will not work here. Opportunities were massive. So I thought, like, this is a great place. Let me go and try uh, banking. I couldn't get to be a diplomat, so I thought, like, I can being diplomat, you serve people, and, and banking, you, uh, same thing, you serve as people. So I moved, I went to National Bank of Dubai, I worked there for 13 years. Mm. I learned a lot, and usually, I mean, people move from international banks to local banks. I did the opposite. So I moved from a local bank to an international bank. And HSBC, you asked me why HSBC, at that time, I had uh, opportunity to work with a local insurance company, which uh, paid me more. But I said, no, I'll go with uh, HSBC. And my dream has been to be with the international firm. Mm. And as I said, I wanted to connect internationally. So I thought this is the best place to go and work and be connected internationally. And that's what I learned in uh, mm. DU internationally and to be connected with people. And that's yeah. how I moved to Bangladesh. All, right. All right, thank you for that. You know, we, we got a chance to talk and we of course met in Dubai and, and I, I was really appreciative and, and struck by um, the, the, the reverence and, and the regard you have for the, for the Emirates and, and for the Middle East in general. And, and you know, I've, I've been able to spend a little bit of time there and I consider uh, the Middle East and the United Arab, em Arab Emirates, high context environments, right? I mean, rich um, uh, cultural histories and legacies. And I, and, and I know that that is dear to you. And I, I wonder if you might just share for, for our audience uh, some, of the, some of the particular salient cultural elements that, that resonate most deeply with you as, a, as an Emirati and as a global business person. Well, uh, as I said, uh, I mean, uh, when I said about the grandfather's house, I mean, we come, like, the, very important for us is we are, we serve everyone. So, in my father's house, we, do, we don't have any servant or anyone to come and welcome the guest. So, me and my brother, we were the two servants that my father had. <laughs> so, we would come and welcome the guest, look after them, bring them tea, coffee, lunch. Uh, if we had big event in my grandfather's house, all of us, like all the children, they will be working. And so I feel servicing the people 
it's a great culture that we have learned. And it stayed with me, even with my work and being uh, at work. I, I, I'm very, very much passionate about service. And I, I hope in HSBC, I mean, to achieve that 3,000 people that we have in HSBC UAE today to embed that culture and serve better the customers that we have. So that's something, I mean, you will find. And, and honestly, today, I mean, this three days that I have come, I think uh, a lot of things have changed here. The hospitality that I find, you guys have been great uh, hosts. And I really want to thank uh, my friend, uh, Sam Same Thomas. Sam's here somewhere. Yeah. He's been someone like a, a friend from school, and we stayed in touch till today and he's been looking after me. And we started to talk about this when he started like, let's, right. let's do this. Now I remember. And I'm here today. Thank you very much, Sam, for all We're, we're grateful, Sam. Thank yeah. you. Uh, so I, I, wanna, I wanna spend a little bit of time just on, on banking in particular and financial markets and banking in the Middle East. And um, first of all, so the UAE for HSBC is considered a scale market. Um, I think your, your, your chairman has been um, unambiguous about that. Help us understand what that, what that means. Uh, in HSBC, we have uh, three type of markets. We have uh, scale market. There are eight countries that are on the scale market. And one developed market, which is UK, and the rest is emerging. So HSBC helps the emerging uh, markets to grow. So UAE is one of the scale, eight scale markets for the uh, HSBC. And we have to have a turnover over a billion dollar. And we should compete with the local banks, with all businesses, commercial business, uh, retail, private bank, uh, investment banking market. And then you have uh, international market, which we have to be the top international bank like we have in US. So US for us is an international market. We compete with international banks. Network is where we help our clients uh, in different markets. And those are the sites like Japan, uh, Kuwait, Bahrain. Those are network mm. uh, market for us. OK. Um, we talked a bit earlier about um, the financial crisis in 2007, 2008, and talked about the ubiquitous, uh, extraordinary nature of instantaneous transaction and connectivity. Uh, banking, of course, uh, is at the center of that. We're able to move just untold amounts of money around the world instantaneously. Uh, if, if networks can be uh, distributed, they will be, and, 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 and that's for the convenience and ease of us all. But it also raises pretty serious concerns, whether it's um, with terrorism or dark money. Give us, give us a sense of your view and uh, HSBC or banking in the least in general, just about the importance of financial crime and compliance activities. How, how does HBC, uh, sorry, um, HSBC think about that, and what can you Tell us about how it's protecting itself. I mean, uh, it's really fundamental for, for us, the financial crime risk. And we have been investing a lot in technology around that. And uh, we've been educating our staff, our people, in a way that it's not something that you have to do only. You have to be convinced about mm -hmm. this is the right thing to do. And not only at HSBC we look at that, but countries and, and, and the region and uh, UAE is following that uh, way of it. So it's part of our DNA. If you remember in the past when you will have a banker or a relationship manager comes in, the worry he, the person had it's about will you be able to return the money that you're taking? Are you credible for this uh, finance that I'm providing you? But today, it's more than that is where did you get the money from? How did you make your wealth? 
So it's very fundamental and very important for everyone. And if you remember a month ago, we had a, an incident in Sri Lanka where uh, there was a bombing and I reached out to our CEO there. We have a bank in uh, Sri Lanka and the CEO was working with us in uh, UAE. First, I asked him, of course, about him and his family and the people there. And then my question was, I hope we are not part of this. Mm. I mean, because the, bank, the banks are the place that people will be transferring money and uh, using it for the wrong things to do. So this is your protecting yourself, you're protecting your uh, country, your organization, your economy. So this is what we want people to do the right thing. So that's important. So when you think about risk, uh, mitigation, management, um, fraud, detection, compliance issues, can you give us a, give us, um, a contrast, um, Middle East versus Western Europe versus North America? Where are the similarities? Where are the differences? Are there some particular challenges that you need to think about just because of you know, uh, the region you're in? Um, what are what are some of the differences? I, I mean, as I said, we are, we are a young country. I mean, and, and Middle East is like, uh, there is a lot happening politically, whether, whether it's uh, regulation, but things are really improving and moving to the right direction. And the learning that's happening uh, from different regulation, regulations around the world and implementation of uh, uh, system in the place, it's happening in the right direction. So I think, I mean, comparison will be really hard to, mm -hmm. to compare Europe, which is, uh, or England, which is developed market with emerging, but the direction that they're taking, it's absolutely in the right mm. direction. Mm -hmm. So we are seeing uh, the growth in that area, the gradually uh, move uh, changes in system and making uh, all the system in banking uh, protected and uh, not only in banking, in financial sectors in different uh, areas. So the learning coming from the West is really improving the Middle East and Gulf countries. Mm. Okay. Um, Back to the, uh, the uh, recent financial crisis. My understanding is that uh, the MENA region, Middle East and North Africa, financial institutions suffered during the crisis, but they suffered not so much because of over leveraged balance sheets um, like the rest of us. They suffered from lack of capital, lack of investment, reduction in trade. And so they were able to sort of protect themselves. Um, if that's right, um, is, uh, is the region similarly protected uh, if there's another? I, th I think this is fair. I off. mean, if you look at the oil uh, com uh, countries being, uh, there was a chart uh, showing you a few, we go 70 years, being really, really, I mean, enjoying the oil price going up. So when it comes uh, to balance sheet or liquidity, they are liquid because of the oil price. Mm -hmm. And you see the governments mm -hmm. or the companies are a little bit comfort there. But that's the time that you start working, looking at your uh, diversifying. And as our economist says, uh, fix your sunroof when it's sunshine, not when it's raining. Mm -hmm. So right. it's really important. Right. Right. So right. That's, that's, that's been happening there. I mean, and, and also, I mean, like when I joined HSBC, I joined in 2008, and that's the time that crisis happened, 2009. It came a little bit late to the UAE, and it came around 2010 when I became the CEO. So we lost $2 million, and I was like, well, I don't know whether I'm going <laughs> to have the job or not. But yeah. four years later, uh, we made around $840 million, and that tells you mm. Not any economy give you that the growth and that uh, transformation. It's very important. Also a testament to your leadership? No. Right. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I, mean, I, 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 mean I, I really built a, a strong team around me. Right. 
So uh, I think the success of it, uh, my success is like from my team, to be honest. No, really, like I, I got really strong team there. I appreciate that. I, I, I have one more question on, on banking that I want to ask and I want to move on. Um, HSBC is the most widely represented international bank in the Middle East. And, and you all, in, uh, in my view, double down on that um, commitment with a stunning $250 million new facility in Dubai. Um, is that, is that, uh, um, was, was that a, a logical extension of a long-term strategy? Was this a, um, a realization of, of a market gaining sort of pace and on a trajectory that maybe you hadn't seen before? Or was this all part of a sort of steady plan? That's a huge investment in a region that most people just don't think of as that large? Well, let me, uh, first of all, the building that we built, this, is, this was my dream to have a headquarter for HSBC there. We've been always being a tenant of uh, different companies or organizations. But HSBC has been in the United Arab Emirates over 70 years. We opened a first bank there in 1946, October. And my speech when I did the opening, it was January, but my father corrected me, he said, no, October. <laughs> because my father worked there also in 1958, before he moved to the British Embassy. So there is a history, and uh, we were the first bank in uh, UAE. We brought the first ATM. We printed the banknote. We were the central bank, and you just, I mean, like, we helped the government in building the airports, bridging the creek, mm. building the ports, and we didn't have a headquarter. Right. So we believed in the economy 70 years, mm. more than 70 years. So I think this is an investment, and yeah. this is uh, something that definitely we believe in the economy of UAE going forward and the future. So it's been yeah. very, and the other one, like being tenant of different people every day, somebody wants to kick you out from your, where right. you are. So right. Or raise said, the price. Let, right. let's, let's have right. our own. And it's been really worked very well because we had offices in different locations. And this building, it's built for our right. own purpose. It's gold uh, lead and uh, energy saving. And it's, everybody's under one roof. And we made sure that we built, I mean, when we were building this, it wasn't like uh, me and the architect or somebody from mm -hmm. headquarter. This building is built by the staff in HSBC UAE. So we asked everybody, what do you want in that mm -hmm. building? Where you want to be? How you want to make it uh, comfortable for you? Right. So we have a gym. We have nice, uh, we have an innovation lab. We have a university, HSBC university. Actually, HSBC universities are on four sites globally. Mm. So one of them is UAE and Dubai. And then, uh, uh, of course, I mean, like we have uh, created a great office for, for yeah. people to work there. Oh, and it looks beautiful. Yeah. Um, so I want to I want to switch gears if we can to just what I refer to as this sort of transformation of, of the Emirates of UAE in particular led by Abu Dhabi and Dubai. And, um, you know, we talked about this earlier. Um, you're in a pretty tough neighborhood, right? I mean, it's not easy to, to um, succeed and to thrive there. And, um, and the development and the capacity of the Emirates is, is, is just astounding for anybody who's, who's been there. Give us a sense um, of, of what this uh, transformation looks like, where's it going, most particular, what's, what's it resulted from? Wh why, why the Emirates? And See, I mean, if you look in the, as you said, the region is around us, there is war zone and uh, it's, it's boiling some places. It's a tough place. Yeah, so uh, le let's look at the region first. I mean, there is uh, projects that's and pipeline of Middle East and North Africa is $2 trillion in infrastructure. And look at the Middle East and China. 
the relationship is doubling and it's really growing fast. And last year, the business with uh, China and Middle East uh, was around $80 billion. And as per uh, World Economic uh, reports that Middle East and North Africa will have created 75 million jobs by 2030. So that's massive, mm -hmm. and that's a big transformation that we're looking at. If you look at the UAE specific, specifically, you see, I mean, like, we used to travel from Dubai to Abu Dhabi. It would take us three to four hours. Mm. And that's just a dirt road, and there was not a uh, good road. But today, look at the 12 lanes uh, Sheikh Zayed Road, and that's big. And you reach there in one hour and a half. And we are looking at flying taxi. We are looking at Hyperloop. And Hyperloop can take you 12 minutes from Dubai to Abu Dhabi. And that's Dubai invested in that company. That's from US, the Hyperloop company. Mm. So that's the transformation. I mean, our economy was in 50s. We were uh, uh, depending on fishing and pearl uh, diving. Mm. And in 1960s, things changed when we had the uh, oil. Mm -hmm. So 70 was the creation, 71 was the creation of the country, and we were looking at mm -hmm. the government and developing. Then 80s and 90s was like looking at ports, infrastructure, uh, airports. 2000 was the, started the investment uh, on inf infrastructure. And today, if you look at DP World, which is Dubai Ports uh, World and uh, Emirates Airlines, they are global uh, leaders. Right. So, right. Um, so you mentioned just these amazing and forward thinking, I mean, Hyperloop and 12 lane um, freeways. And, and um, in many ways, uh, Dubai, I think in particular, is is the epitome of a of a um, of modernity, um, and yet, as we talked earlier, there there is a complicated relationship in parts of the Middle East between modernity and and legacy and the ability to migrate between history and culture and 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 um, and modernity. And I I, I wonder if if um, you can just help us understand why. Uh, so many regions, so many countries in the region struggle with keeping up with the times and investing wisely and strategically and consistently in areas that matter. Because um, in many ways, the Emirates is, is, a, is a bit of an outlier. I mean, there's a couple of other countries that I won't name, but uh, we, we talked about them earlier. But, but give us a sense of what, what's going on there. Uh, See, I mean, as I said, I mean, the country has invested in the human capital. I mean, we have traveled all the way from uh, our country to come to U.S. to learn from you guys and take this learning back there. And the government there, I mean, the leadership is uh, a decision maker, His Highness Sheikh Mohammed. Right. And in Dubai, for example, and what you see today, the transformation that happened, he's a brave man. And he has taken decisions to grow and make sure that the people get the best at this time. I know you're saying everything is happening around us, but still, I mean, like we call UAE as the safe haven among all the countries. And we still attract the, uh, investors, we attract uh, people to come and I don't have the numbers, but still people are coming and they want to live and reside in, in UAE, whether it's Abu Dhabi or Dubai and Sharjah. I think yourself being in Sharjah lived for some time there. Sure, taught at the University of Sharjah for yeah. a while. Um, uh, so there's, a, there's one comment that you made earlier that just really struck me, and um, I want to repeat it for our audience, and that is that you're, the leaders in, in Abu Dhabi um, are making preparations to sell the last barrel of oil in 2050. In, in 2050. I, 
that's um, astounding and, and that prescience, again, is, is kind of unique. Uh, I mean, lots of countries are talking about that, but you're actually laying the foundation to have an economy with similar growth um, in, once the petroleum reserves run out. See, I mean, diversification is the central of our uh, right. plans. I mean, if you look at our the oil, uh, G, uh, from oil, the GDP in the UAE is 45% now. And we are growing, I mean, going out of it faster than our neighbors. So in Dubai, for example, is 3% dependent on oil. So the plan is in 2050 that we sell the last mill and we have diversified. Right. And, 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 and I think we are looking at uh, building a great infrastructure, looking at uh, sustainable energy, uh, being the global hub, and tourism is important for us, innovation, and all what I'm naming, and we have learned it from mm -hmm. here. So, right. so that's where we are yeah. uh, heading. Yeah, there are lots of reasons to, to be uh, bullish on the United Arab Emirates. Um, so listen, we, we have a um, little bit of time left and I, I, wanna, I wanna pivot again if we could. I've had the time to s spend with you today. I've visited you in, in Dubai and I, I wanna, I wanna um, return um, the compliment of the generosity that you've displayed to us anytime we visited your office. I mean, you always make Thank time, you. whether it's myself, whether it's other members of the university, uh, our students, our alumni. I, I want you to know how much we, we appreciate you. Um, you taking the time out of what we know is a ridiculous schedule. It means a, means a great deal. Um, we've got a number of students here and young professionals and seasoned professionals. And, and you know, um, I wonder if you would just share um, some thoughts you have uh, as it relates to leadership, the style, the characteristics, what's worked for you, mistakes that you've made, um, any, any bits of, of wisdom you can, uh, you can impart here? Mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. <laughs> anyway, no, I mean, uh, what, I mean, like what I can uh, share with you, I mean, there, there are, professionally, uh, I had to create, in 2010, uh, we had the bank uh, with the regional. So I had to create a, a UAE bank for uh, HSBC. So I went out and I, we are lucky that in HSBC we have uh, a, a big people uh, pool of people you can recruit from different uh, regions, different countries. And I really looked from, for the people that I can really learn from. And I wanted the people that really know the business better than me. Because otherwise I'll end up doing the job myself. So my success is mm. from my people. Mm. So I picked the right people to be part of the team. So that advice I will give you that it's very important to have the people that you can learn from. If you think you are the smartest person in the room, then you are in the wrong room. <laughs> the second one, which is uh, uh, personal, I mean, you think always, I mean, like, uh, you have a goal and you dream about it, and you think that this is my next seat that I'm gonna take. <laughs> and the organization is thinking somewhere else. Mm. And how you convert that to being negative in your mind, you know? Don't tell me that, oh no, I don't think about it like that. We all think about it. But really, I mean, like converting that to positive, that how I'm gonna learn more from this and be better executive. So that's the challenge that I went through it myself. I went twice. Mm. So I really worked on it and just converted that to a positive. So definitely, I mean, you will find yourself sometimes, you want that place, you want that job to have or that thing that you wanted, but you can't get everything because you think something and the organization thinks something else. 
So that's a challenge that mm -hmm. I had personally. No, appreciate that. Yeah. Um, final question on, on leadership. You are operating uh, in a truly global environment um, with instantaneous connectivity and all kinds of cross-cultural issues. And, um, and I wonder if you could, you could let us know what about your preparation has enabled you to be so successful. Um, let's just forget about the banking, which is in itself difficult. But, but in the region you're in, um, with the multitude of um, responsibilities that you have, cross country, what's that like? Uh, I mean, uh, you see, I mean, like looking at uh, the country and the environment and where we live, I mean, there, there are lots of challenges that you are facing. And also, we look, I, look, I always ask myself this question, what's the next challenge that I'm going to have? is a challenge that you're waiting for. I mean, today, if I think if I'm gonna compete uh, in future, I don't know whether I'm gonna compete with a bank or it's gonna be Uber or Google <laughs> or Amazon. So those are the things that, mm -hmm. I mean, and, and, and having a, a, a right team around you and being uh, uh, well organized and putting, uh, time for everything and thoughts and thinking. So that, that's the area that I would think like more uh, to be successful in. Hmm. But challenges you always face, I mean like, right. especially with our region. I mean, it's uh, sometimes people call me, you're in a war zone. <laughs> but yeah, the war zone is around us. Right. But we, we have to make sure we create the best living and create the best environment for people to grow and have that. Right, well, I mean, so far you all have, 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 have kept the sort of contagion at bay and, and continue to be the sort of sea of, of, of calm and growth. And so um, obviously a, a testament to, to leadership and, and thanks for, for sharing that with us. Um, I wanna make sure that we've got some time for audience questions. Um, but first, would you please join me in giving Abdul Fada a warm round of applause for his time and effort. I just want to say, I just want to say, um, thank you. I want to say one other thing before we open up. I think there's some mics around here that um, uh, I have been, among other things, struck by um, your humility and authenticity. Uh, I mean, I spent a lot of time with you, including in some less than ideal circumstances this morning, so you know what people are like. Uh, and um, so it's been just a, a pleasure to be able to, to, to see you in action. Um, so questions? Yes, sir, over here a couple. Mm -hmm. I said to Brent, any difficult question he will answer, the easy one. <laughs> okay, sure thank you. Be, I'm sure there'll be none. Um, so I'm curious on the banking and financial side, uh, what impact have you seen from Brexit, both on the opportunity side and risk for capital? Well, there you go. Brexit. <laughs> I wish I had uh, knew what's going to happen, <laughs> <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> I mean, I don't have much. Uh, I think we are, as an HSBC, we are well prepared for that. I mean, we have a big bank in France, so... Uh, we are very much diversified as an HSBC, so uh, I don't think we will have any, but more of a Brexit, I don't have very much insight of that. But as a bank, I know that we are well uh, diversified because we are in many regions. But uh, as a Europe, we have a bank already in uh, France that operates, and it's a big bank. So definitely some people also will be moving down there from uh, London. Mm -hmm. okay, thank you. I hope I answered your question. Is it somewhere else? <laughs> oh, here and then over there. Here, yes. And then next. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum salam. My name is Michael Thompson, University of Denver, class of 2000. 
really an inspiration seeing and listening to your story. Greatly appreciate you spending time with us. Thank you. And my question is this, you've got such a distinguished career, and again, appreciate the journey, sharing some pieces with us. What are your thoughts for the future? Are you looking at this as the last stop? Are you, you mentioned couldn't, couldn't be a diplomat. Are you thinking political maybe in your future? <laughs> doing some other things outside of banking. Just what does the future hold for you? Thank you. Uh, I'm very passionate about what I do. I mean, as I mentioned, I mean, like, if the call comes, definitely I will go. But so far, I'm really enjoying my uh, work at HSBC. It's a great organization. And I have really uh, learned there and HSBC a lot and I'm very, very much passionate, but I want to grow more with HSBC. The next job I'm looking at, it's gonna be a regional role. So uh, I do some of the com countries now, like I do UAE, Bahrain, Kuwait, and uh, Algeria, but my ambition is that, yes, I want to continue with HSBC and grow. But you never know if the call comes, yes. But I feel I'm still a diplomat being uh, with HSBC I, I travel all the, uh, everywhere and I serve all kinds of customers. It's the same thing that diplomat do, but on the business <laughs> side. All right. Uh, over here. <coughs> my name's Mark Donovan. I'm a relatively new uh, Denver resident. And you made my day, if not my decade, by claiming that you're going to sell the last barrel by 2050. So if I could be so bold, I'd like to ask a question and also pose a challenge. The challenge being to maybe do it sooner. <laughs> and the question is, with um, what percentage of fossil fuel related assets do you believe to be stranded and how will the wind down on those potentially affect global markets? I don't know. Um, uh, the percentage of fossil fuels that will remain stranded and how that will affect global markets. That's a difficult one. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm not an expert on fossil fuel, uh, but I mean, as I said, I mean, like we, we are look uh, the 2050, you said it's gonna be very late. <laughs> so, but if, if we are thinking about the uh, plan and putting it together, definitely we are not just thinking about 2050 as a government. I mean, I'm sure the government is thinking much earlier than that, but we will be prepared when the oil finish, and that's the uh, uh, last barrel that we will be uh, selling. So diversification is becoming very, uh, very important mm -hmm. for us, and moving to non-oil uh, revenue is becoming important for the countries in oil uh, and gas. I hope I... Uh, Thank you. Over here. Firstly, thank you, thank you so much for coming tonight, Mr. Sharaf. Uh, my name is Owen Orr, graduating senior in real estate and finance in a few weeks. Uh, you mentioned geopolitical issues, but my question is, what's the biggest difference in banking in the U.S. versus the Middle East that stems from cultural differences? Did you hear that? So he just was looking at, um, back to the cultural environment, cultural differences that exist in banking or other industries um, between the Middle East and North America um, that you found and that you can maybe help. help uh, I, think, I think at the end of the day, I mean, we are all working as the same and there is uh, no different uh, in culture because we all have to serve our customer. So at the end of the day, we are there in this uh, organization or a position to make the customers uh, servicing them and providing with bet the best advice and being transparent. So I think the culture in all, uh, whether it's US, whether it's uh, UAE, we have the similarity there. It, it works that, that way. So. We, 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 we have been building in, uh, specifically in HSBC the culture of a speak up, for example, mm -hmm. uh, making the organization the healthiest uh, human system, having 
ways of working uh, better. And I think this, if, if we talk about these uh, cultural things, it's the same for the US and it's the same for the United Arab Emirates and other countries. Mm -hmm. There is a big similarity. Mm -hmm. Um, hi, first of all, I want to say uh, Ramadan Mubarak. Shukran. Um, my name is Majid, and uh, I'd like to welcome you, r welcome you back again to DU. Thank you. And uh, thank you for taking the time and coming here. Uh, my question is regarding my home country, uh, Saudi Arabia. And I was just curious, um, since Saudi Arabia is also trying to diversify its, its economy and switch from a uh, non-oil dependent uh, country, um, in your opinion, what are some of the uh, most promising industries in Saudi Arabia that um, people should focus on, especially from an entrepreneurial uh, perspective? Thank you. Uh, I mean, in Saudi, what's happening today, I mean, it's a big transformation. And on the, uh, looking at the non-oil revenue, they're looking at from uh, $163 billion uh, dollars, which is today, by 2030, they're looking to go to $1 trillion. And what's happening in Saudi today, it's a massive uh, project. And I think the whole region is uh, uh, benefiting from uh, those projects. Now, where to be focused? I think, I mean, uh, there is lots of areas to be focused on, construction, uh, finance, consultancies uh, becoming really big. Lots of consultants, you will see them flying from Dubai to living in Dubai and going to Saudi. The flights are full. So that's something. And I think uh, if you put any projects together, definitely it's going to work with the com countries that are transforming that fast and it becoming to a non oil uh, diversifying. And I think opportunities a lot, whether it's in UAE, whether it's in uh, Saudi, Kuwait, uh, there, there are great opportunities in the Middle East. And as I said, all the countries are working and uh, creating these uh, opportunities. Okay, okay. okay. Uh, back here, and then one more up here. And what is the future of uh, blockchain and cryptocurrency in your view? Blockchain and? Blockchain and cryptocurrency is what I heard. Uh, I can talk about blockchain a little bit. It's becoming very important and I think we are very much focused on uh, blockchain because uh, that's the future and we have launched, I mean like as a government also, the UAE government is 90 to 93% smart and uh, in, in Dubai they have created the innovation museum which the, uh, will, will, ha will have uh, blockchain, will have uh, all kind of uh, uh, digitalization future uh, happening. On crypto coin I think uh, we don't, as an HSBC or personally, we don't support it because it's something not uh, regulated and difficult. Uh, if you meant uh, the electronic uh, currency, that's something also the future. I think that's, that's coming uh, faster than what we were expecting. Okay, thank you. Okay, two more. There's one here and then one in the back, I think. Um, right. Natalie, right where you are. Right, thank you. Hi, welcome. Thank you for being here. You. Um, you mentioned China's growth in your country. Um, I guess I'm curious, where do you see opportunity for the United States in your country? I mean, I'm sure banks to banks and construction probably, but in general, where would people, how would uh, business people come into your country from the United States? And, is it as diverse for the United States to do business there as it is for, let's say, the Chinese or other countries? You know, probably based on some of the, the bad things that people might think of us, you know, I don't know. So I'm, I'm asking, you know, do you see any 
roadblocks for uh, people from the United States doing business in your country? I, I think the opportunities are there. And we do a lot with uh, different uh, areas. But as you said, China's uh, growing uh, faster and faster in the relationship. And uh, I think the opportunities with U.S. Could be, could be in uh, uh, Silicon Valley or from uh, uh, smart. Digitalization is very important. But also, don't forget, China's competing uh, in that area as well. So today, I mean, like if you see, we have 50,000 American living in the, in the UAE. And I think the numbers will be growing as well. And compared to Chinese, I mean, like we had uh, one million visitors last year in, in the UAE. But we are a population of nine million. So one million means you see them everywhere. So. That, that's growing faster, I think. Uh, but yeah, I mean, the, 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 there are opportunities in uh, investors. I mean, we, we get lots of uh, FDIs coming to the country from US, and that's uh, somewhere that we look at also. With the, with doing, we, when we do roadshows, we go, if we do North America, we come to US, and there is uh, interest in investing in, in our country. So. Yeah. Okay, I think there was one more somewhere. I think it was right up here. The young man right here. Sorry if I'm just stealing like this, the lights yeah, are. Yeah, it's kind of hard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, my name is Peter Frank, and my question is tangential to um, blockchain and cryptocurrencies. Um, have you felt that the rapidly transforming, or transforming um, financial technologies have been beneficial or detrimental in terms of uh, HSBC's capacity to? Um, integrate and acquire and understand these technologies? Um, and do you think that they will be uh, challenging or serve as an asset moving forward? See, I think, I think this is, uh, thank you for the question. It's very important for us uh, going to, towards the blockchain and digitalization. I think if you don't follow uh, those, you will be left behind. So definitely, I mean, we are investing in that. Uh, we launched uh, our first blockchain in uh, China, in uh, Hong Kong, and also in the UAE. We are uh, really advanced in, on blockchain. We just we we are launching a blockchain there, but definitely digitalization is something that you can't uh, ignore. So, uh, huge investment is happening in uh, in, in that area, and. HSBC is a big bank. So to see the difference and to see the things uh, changing, you will see it gradually because we start with different uh, scale markets, then we come to the international. But definitely that's our focus. And, and I, this is the reason also we have these innovation labs where we bring uh, university students and we share with them their ideas and we take some of their ideas with our employees and our staff. Thank you. Um, just a couple of closing remarks. First, thank you all for being here. Thank you for your support this evening. Thank you for your support of this amazing series. Uh, I have to give a, a huge shout out to Kate Dillon, uh, our superwoman back there, who uh, <laughs> just finds a way to get this done no matter what. Um, thank you, Kate. For those of you that need CME credit, um, you can take care of that in the lobby. We hope that as many of you as possible can join us for the, uh, the reception. And please join me one final time in thanking our Great. guest of honor, Abdul Fala Sarah. Really thank you all. Thank you very much for coming, and thank you, Brent, for making this happen. I'm really honored to be it here. Is, thank you. I'm, thank you very much. Best thing we do. Thank you.